Welcome to Die Hard on a Blank, the podcast where we explore the influence of Die Hard on action cinema, one action movie at a time. I'm Philip Gawthorne, and with me as always is Liam Billingham, and today's film is Passenger 57. It's Die Hard on a Plane. Fasten your seatbelts, terror at 35,000 feet. I'm making up taglines for the movie that we're talking about today, which we have a special guest for. Ronald Young Jr. Ronald, how are you? Hello, Liam. It's good to be here. Hello, Phil. I'm glad. I'm glad y'all invited me in for this one. Oh, my goodness. We're so glad you picked it. We were excited that you did. Uh, real quick, Ronald and I go back. What? I, I knew you when, Ronald. Ronald, before you, when you were just a, but a, but a, but a, but a podcaster, and now you're, you're, the, you're the man. You are a re- you, I'm going to tell you who you are. Ronald is a <laughs> regular contributor to NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour. He is the host of what I think is a really great podcast on film and TV called Leaving the Theater, where he reviews the movie as he walks out of the movie theater. It's a nice, you know, it's not just a two schlubs, for example, on microphones talking about 30-year-old <laughs> movies. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's <laughs> self-loathing. No, it is, uh, it is an instant reaction, and I think that's really, really fun, and I enjoy it. And also, Ronald is one of my favorite people to talk pop culture, especially industry, when it is on, and we are Oof. very, very much waiting for that third season. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, Ronald. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, great. We're happy to have you. So what's your relationship to Passenger 57? Well, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I'm an 80s baby. So this movie came out in 1992. And I remember the previews for this movie. And I remember the excitement, especially amongst black folks, about this movie coming out. Because uh, by the time this movie had come out, Wesley Snipes was already well known in the black community. Uh, he had done King, no, he had done Mo Better Blues. He had done New Jack City. He had done Jungle Fever, all movies that were like very precious to black folks, especially New Jack City. Like the role that he plays Nino Brown in that one is something that still gets memed to this day. So like seeing that movie come out and, and seeing that he was being a bona fide action star and it wasn't like a black film, it was a big film. You know what I mean? I think there was some notoriety to that amongst the black community. I know that. And I feel like hearing other folks folks talk about Passenger 57 was kind of like me as a second grade, third grade Ronalds be like, oh, Wesley Snipes. We're all talking about Wesley Snipes now. And he's kind of like the black action star that I was growing up with at the time. So it didn't occur to me until I started doing research for this movie that this was the movie that, you know, then launches him into the other movies that we see. Like this is before Blade. This is before Murder at 1600. Before all of these other uh, uh, Drop Zone. Before all of these other very bona fide, like martial arts driven, very much Wesley Snipes movie that we come to know and love today. It didn't occur to me that this was the beginning, but this was very much the first one into that direction for him. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me and Phil, I'm curious to hear your experience. I remember, I didn't see this in the theater. I, at that point, I don't think I was seeing R rated movies in the theater as much, but I remember at school, someone being like, I watched passenger 57 over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what's Passenger 57? And uh, this girl in my class was like, oh, it's this movie where like this guy's on a plane and he, you know, there's a terrorist and there's a guy. And I was like, I went home and I was like, dad, we got to rent Passenger 57. And that began this like, we rented it, we loved it. And then I think we bought the VHS and like every, I have such distinct memories of Saturday mornings being like, Let's just put on Passenger 57, you know? Let's just go for it. You have a weird thing like that also with Die Hard 2 where you like sort of planes in peril seem to be like a sort of comfort blanket. Oh, weird yeah. Comfort I love blanket a, I love a you. plane. You find the relaxing background music. Plane in like, peril. A little executive decision. little Die Hard 2. It kind of just chills 2. you out. Ooh, yeah, executive uh, decision. What a great pick. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that movie, that movie kicks ass. Uh, Phil, was this a big movie in the UK? It was. You know, and, and Ronald really nailed it in terms of its, um, I think, the cultural importance of this movie my experience of it was this was just like the trailer for this was ubiquitous on every rental it just felt like it was on you know in those days where you would rent a movie for our younger uh, younger listeners um <laughs> you would rent a movie and there would be maybe you'd go five to a or building trailers, with tapes in it <laughs> right you go to a physical place and rent a, a rent a video cassette and on that video cassette would be five or six trailers before the main thing just like in in the movies but this one was everywhere it was 
it, it was kind of iconic. It was a great trailer, great title, great concept, and so so execution. We're gonna we're gonna litigate that. I think we all have slightly different views. Uh, um, Liam is a big fan, though, right? You like I look. I look. Hold this, it. Wait. Sometimes there are movies that you love that you are this like is not one of them. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I love this movie, but it's not like I'm it's... leaving the studio. <laughs> okay, come on, come on, come on back. Look, before we jump into our our feelings, maybe we should give the kids listening to this pod the pe- the youngins who you didn't have never been to a video store. The some, TikTokers, the TikTokers, some top line <laughs> facts about the film Passenger Fifty Seven. Phil, will you do the honors? Yes, I'd be delighted to. Um, I was just thinking I should do this as some kind of like really corny uh, captain giving the uh, <laughs> the, yeah, the pre or, or, as, or as Charles Rain like listing his right, demands. Right, right. You know, if you like don't want really to wear your slithery British... you don't have to. <laughs> um, all right. So, Passenger Fifty Seven was released by Warner Brothers uh, in the U.S. on November sixth, nineteen ninety-two. That's one month after Under Siege, our last movie, which was released on October 9th of that year. Interestingly, both both movies, which are very very similar, were distributed by Warner Brothers. You know, this was an era a, a, an era where studios are doing these kind of like diehard knockoffs uh, at an alarming rate. Like it's kind of increasing exponentially. The fact that it was two by Warners in the space of like a month. Golden age. Um, yep, for sure. So, and we're also now four and a half years after the release of Die Hard in the summer of 1988. The movie was directed by Kevin Hooks and produced by Dan Paulson, Lee Rich and Dylan Sellers. It stars the great Wesley Snipes, Bruce Payne, Tom Sizemore, who we're going to talk about, and uh, Alex Datcher. Uh, the screenplay was written by David Lowry and Dan Gordon from a story by Gordon and Stuart Raffle. And on an estimated budget of $15 million, it grossed $66 million. So that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good return. You know, this was a big hit. Phil, I don't take issue with your top line fact checks, but you missed something very, very important about this movie, which is the film debut of Elizabeth Hurley. Oh yeah, in the, well, I've got a lot. I've got a lot to say in about, the role uh, as a Ms. villainous Hurley. stewardess, villainous mm-hmm. flight attendant. Um, yeah, that that feels important to me. So so let's go back and do it. Duly again. Duly noted. No, I'm just kidding. Um, is this the first Die Hard on a plane? Oh. Yeah, I, I, it is. It's it's. Of course, there would be many others. We already mentioned one executive decision, Air Force One, uh, many many more. They're still making them to this day. Um, classic Die Hard on a blank premise, right? Like group of hijackers take over a plane. It's up to one man to fight back. Uh, yeah. So in in we may as well talk about our. Do you, I want to say Die Hard DNA, but this is your moment, Liam, to do your Jurassic Park uh, riff. Okay, so let's. You have to no, introduce this it. before I get carried okay. away. <clears throat> Seeing as this is a, a, a podcast about movies from the '90s, I feel it's only appropriate to reference Jurassic Park, which is Phil, Phil and Ronald. Let's talk about our Die Hard DNA. Don't so, shake your um, head. I, I'm Ronald, so I can see you <laughs> on video. I'm less amused with you, Liam. Oh, come <laughs> on, <laughs> man. Um, yeah, so this was the first um, kind of Die Hard on a Plane movie. Um, there will, of course, be many others. It's a classic Die Hard on a, on a, on a blank premise. What is a Die Hard um, but, on a but, blank but, premise for those? You so know, do those I have, to, who I have shown to do this up, every time, Yeah, right? you do it every time. <laughs> but, you know, this time we've okay. got the Ronald heads listening to the podcast. And I don't know what right, the corollary right. between <laughs> the Ronald heads the and the Die Hard heads is. So I want to give the Ronald heads uh, a sense of what Die Hard on a blank means. So yeah, so Die Hard on a Blank is the cultural industry shorthand for any movie that replicates the the Die Hard formula of a group of bad guys take over a blank, uh, a zoo. Um, a zoo? Could be... <laughs> That's zoo my new one. I have to give you a new one each time. We bought time. a zoo. Uh, is actually Die Hard a, in a zoo? It, it, <laughs> What's happening here? Uh, you know, it could be, uh, so could be the, all kinds of this things. Is, you're out of control, and I got to stop you. So, you're going to rein me so in. in. Charles, in rein me case, in. In this case, Charles, rein you in. In this case, this is about a group of hijackers taking over a plane, and it's up to one man to fight back. Ronald, what's your relationship to Die Hard? You've already said ill things about Passenger 57, so I hope you're not going to say them about the classic and the inspiration for this podcast, Die Hard. No, ironically, uh, I I love Die Hard. I think I guess it's not ironic. I unironically love Die Hard. And funny, 
enough, the first Die Hard movie I saw was actually Die Hard with a Vengeance. And that was because it came on HBO and I watched it yep. in the summer at home when my parents were at work and we didn't have summer camp or anything. So we were just stuck in the house. So I watched it then and I had no connection of it to the rest of the series. Many years later, at some point I watched Die Hard and I just remember being like, wow, this is a great action movie. Then the more I watched it and the more commentary I heard about it, the more I really just started to really start falling in love with this movie for what it does as an action movie. Uh, Linda Holmes from Pop Culture Happy Hour says one of the greatest things about Die Hard is that every single scene in it is either set up or payoff. Every single scene. And it's very efficiently told in that regard. And I use that kind of as a rubric for other action movies to say, why are you doing this? And actually not even non-action movies to say, is this a setup or a payoff? Or is this just supposed to be artsy? Like, why am I looking at what's on the screen? Die Hard does that so well. And of course, I love to debate on whether or not it's a Christmas movie. So what's, what's your, your view on it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Whoa, 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 controversial. Whoa. You, you on that debate? It's a Christmas movie. Yay. <laughs> Damn right it is. I you're in the right place then, Ronald. You're in the right, pl I yeah. mean, in the right place. That's a great analysis of Die Hard 2. <laughs> we've, we've talked about that a lot, how it's basically a sort of Swiss watch of cause and effect. Yes, correct. Um, Swiss it's watch. A great, I love that. Uh, yes. There's not a moment wasted. I don't yes. know if Passenger 57 is a Swiss watch of, it is of, not. Uh, of cause and effect. Stop it. It but is absolutely not. Why don't you... <laughs> Ronald, there's a time and a place for this. All but right, Phil, sorry, sorry. Why, don't you <laughs> why don't you take us through the way... Die Hard and Passenger 57 have a few things in common. Yeah, so they both have this uh, gentlemanly, well-spoken villain played by a British stage actor. Um, they both have an independent-minded hero who frequently defies authority. Um, there's a little smattering of class consciousness in Passenger 57. I'd say a little bit less uh, overt than in Die Hard, but there is a sort of affinity for the more blue-collar uh, workers, uh, such as the, the flight attendants, and there's a little bit of suspicion towards the authority figures, like the airline boss and uh, the, the, certainly the police. Um, the co-screenwriter of the movie, David Lowry, would go on to write the uh, Die Hard on a Train movie, Money Train, mm. in 1995. Um, producer Lee Rich would go on to produce the Die Hard in a Hospital movie, Desperate Measures, in 1998. Um, and we can't forget thing... that Kevin Hooks directed Fled, which I turned on yesterday in yeah, the background yeah. after watching Passenger 57. I kind of like that movie. I like Fled I kind of like it. I think it's a yeah, lot of it's fun. fun. It's fun. I watched it recently. Um, the other one, one fun little side note though, that I did want to pull up, which is that Char the villain of this piece, Charles Rain, played by Bruce Payne. Have you noticed how his hair look and style is very reminiscent of diehard terrorist Heinrich, who is the yes. one that McLean kills in the boardroom yes. before your man Marco oh, the meets guy who's his like, demise? Don't shoot! That guy, the don't shoot guy? Yeah. It, yeah. He comes oh, in immediately yeah. after that. Yeah. He's kind of got those flowing locks and he's, uh. I think his job is to set up the detonators. You see him up there, like, kind of fooling around, and he is a dead ringer for Heinrich. So, something to think about. I think now's the time, before we jump into our section on anatomy of an action movie, where we talk about how we feel about this movie, because I think we need to clear the yeah. air. There's some tension Agreed. in the room about Passenger 57. Ronald. This movie is absolute garbage <laughs> uh, from, from top to bottom. <laughs> Uh, wow. <laughs> it's just, there are, it is, it, it's a bad movie. Uh, the writing is terrible. The acting is hackneyed. Uh, there is a woman in this movie who looks distractingly like Michael Jackson uh, to the point where I wondered how she got cast for this role. Uh, it, I mean, looking at her, and it, there's nothing to say about the attractiveness or any of that. I'm just saying the reminiscence of her to Michael Jackson was so close that it felt like that they didn't say something felt like a Were you distracted by it? Yes, especially if in the same movie you're going to make a comment about how uh, Wesley Snipes looks like Arsenio Hall. Mm -hmm. If that's going to be a running joke, it seems like the easy reverse of that joke is, well, this woman looks like Michael Jackson, obviously, in here, which felt like kind of, I remember watching that and being like, that's that's unusual, but I'm sure that that's not a plot point. Uh, I think that there are parts of this movie, especially one part where there are elements in which the uh, John Cutter gets to a place in the movie, and when the plane flies over that place, you 
you see Confederate flags flying. So immediately my red flag bells go off like, wow, this is not a safe place for anyone black. And sure enough, there's a large portion of the movie that is hinges on mistaken identity in this movie by cops of a black man, which I felt like was a little bit squandered in that they weren't overtly racist. They were like, this guy's a nuisance and he's not supposed to be here. But it wasn't until it wasn't, it didn't feel as like as realistic in if that happened in real life for them to look at this man and be like, yo, this guy, this guy doesn't belong here. Throw him in jail. We're going to shoot him right there on the streets. It felt like there was a missed opportunity. Granted, this movie was made in 1992. So maybe they were still thinking about it, thinking about race in a completely different way then. But I remember watching that and being like, I wonder if this happened, if it was in 99, 1992, I wonder if it happened before or after the Rodney King beatings. Because at that point, I'm like, well, then you have like, you're kind of topical mm. in that moment. Then, of course, there's one of the worst uttered lines in all of cinema history. Okay, that might be hyperbole. But one of the worst, what I think is up there at least, is when he says, hey, are you a gambling man? And it says, hey, let me give you some advice. Always bet on black. As soon as I looked at that, I was like, a black person did not write that line. A black person did, no black person took a pin to page and said, always bet on black. Yeah, that'll get them in there. And especially the way the camera shot pushes it on that moment. Yeah, they're like dolly so, in. Yeah. So overall, and, and that's the thing. It's sure it's a fun movie. Sure, you turn it on and watch it in the background, all that. And and Liam, I understand that you have a childhood connection to this movie, which I would argue is probably your strongest, your strongest motivator for saying that this is actually good. But just actually sitting down, down and watching it, I'm just like, man, there is they are chewing scenery in some of these portions. And then the back and forth between uh Charles Rain and John Cutter were sometimes unbearable to watch in terms of the way they were like, <laughs> well, if you don't matter, I will. Like just a very smart. I think it's fair to say, the two of them. and I know we're going to break this all down, that Ra, in a way, and, and maybe, uh, Phil, you'll be the, the tiebreaker in this conversation, but, like, I really enjoy this movie. I'm not sure it's a good I movie. I think you should you give know? the counter argument, Liam, like, okay. for our jury. Like, for the jury, uh, like, yeah. jury give, of the, our give the defense. Like, I, Ronald's prosecuting, so you can give the defense. I think it's significant that, you know, you mentioned that there's, like, Die Hard after Die, die Hard on a blank, you know, movies coming out at an alarming rate right now. And they're kind of, like, capitalizing on the success of Die Hard uh, and Die Hard 2. I think it's significant that this movie takes place on a plane or uh, in a, you know, airport because it feels like a book you pick up impulsively at the airport before you get on the plane. It's like, it's breezy, it moves, it's a little stupid, it's a little cheesy, but... That's fair. It, it... It, I, I want to, and I don't mean this in like a, it's a, this a kind of a cliche argument, but I pressed play on it on Monday night, having, I told this to Phil, I kind of had forgotten that I had to watch the movie this week. And at 10 p.m. on Monday night, I was like, oh shit, I have to watch Passenger 57. Now, Passenger 57 is a movie I've seen 15 times and, and even rewatched in the past couple of years. But I was like, I'll just watch the first 15 minutes and I'll finish it tomorrow night because, you know, but then I couldn't turn it off. And it's because it's such like an easy, breezy <laughs> kind of watch, you know? And like, I, Ronald, I think you're right. There are like implications to the 1992 of it all that are like, <laughs> you know, like, like a little- Like, wasn't the LA, LA was on fire yeah, at this time? some cringy because stuff of racism. In there. <laughs> there's some cringy stuff on there. But I think I also had this weird, I watched that movie, movie enough as a kid that like, I, I re-noticed things that I hadn't seen since I was a kid. Like, there's a moment when Rain is on the phone with the plane, and he's like, Daddy's coming home. <laughs> so cringe. It's so weird. And yeah. Snipes is just staring at him from behind him, like, I'm going to get you. And I think those little things that I remember from enjoying the movie, I, I look, is this, like, as good as Die Hard? No, it's, it's far below. But, like, it's an hour and 22 minutes. It cooks. I think that that... Uh, works for me. And I think there are some individually kind of amazing little things that happen in it. But, but yes, yeah, I'm but, not. Leo, but let me just say, you don't, I don't think there's any, this isn't me hating this movie is not indictment on you or you liking this movie. Because right. I think there's a series of movies in the 90s that I think if we just went back and forth, if you go from like 92 to like 2002, it's just going to be, you're going to get a bunch of movies that were bad that I loved. Oh, totally. And it's going to be the same way back and forth, simply because they were formidable years for us. Nostalgia, uh, baby. Like, 
in the style, like think about the soundtrack, who was in it, the way they yeah, looked, right. aesthetics, all of that stuff's going to play into it in a way that if you just sat down and critically analyzed it, you're just like, oh man, they uh, they kind of missed the mark. Well, and to your one, point, but it doesn't stop you from loving it. It you doesn't, know? and it and it kicks off. I think that you're absolutely right in that. It, and then I want to throw it to Phil, but it, it kicks off a relationship with Wesley Snipes that continues yes. for movie lovers, and to he this gets day. better. Yes. Like watching yes. him in and anything now, like the new stuff, you're kind of like, oh, it's Wesley Snipes. I love Wesley yes. Snipes, you know? Like, yes. so it, it's, it does for the, you know, the genre, what other movies have done. And they, I can't help but feel nostalgic about that and also be like, mm, a delicious 22 minutes of, of uh, or tw hour and 22 <laughs> minutes of like trashy action. Phil, I've said my piece. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like I, I'm going to be sort of splitting the difference between you guys here because I kind of see it both ways. In the sense that I, like Liam, I love this movie. I own this movie. I have a tremendous nostalgic attachment to this movie. But at the same time, I can view it critically clear-eyed in the way that Ronald is and pull it apart with a ton of issues that are either, you know, just uh, just poor choices or kind of cringy or dated or, you know, what whatnot. I can kind of, the two spaces kind of coexist in my brain, critical assessment and unapologetic love. Um, I think if, if we move to the anatomy of an action movie section, it will actually allow me to kind of yeah. unpack my thesis, which which actually takes the kind of position of both things. Because part of the part of the problem with this film is an incredible premise that they almost immediately uh, botch. okay. Well, slow down. So um, let's let's so, get into our anatomy of an action movie section. Something of Phil's design, in which we list the tenets. We live in a twilight world. And there are no friends at dusk. Of the, oh my god! Yeah, that's that, Ronald. That's where you are. You got that's, to it before I could. Yeah. That's, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I jumped the gun there. It's okay. Listen, Let's, I watched that movie over and over. I can't and stop over watching it. The yeah. anatomy of an action movie is the section in which Phil discusses the breaks down the action movie according to a few categories, and I will list them for you, and then we'll we'll talk them through. The premise, the ticking clock, which is the device or or uh the device that sets the plot moving whatever the case might be uh the heroes the villains the action and the humor and an added section that i like to talk about the leading lady which it feels <laughs> ronald is gonna have some thoughts on so let's Listen, jump right i'm gonna in. defend alex Thatcher like hardcore like I, i'm so we'll, we'll we can do that I, I'm, oh, I'm a fan Phil, why don't you take us through the premise of the movie? Yeah, so, okay, so the premise is thus. While notorious British hijacker Charles Rain is being transferred to LA to face trial, the commercial plane that he's traveling on is taken over by his accomplices in order to aid his escape. However, the bad guys did not reckon with passenger number 57, John Cutter, a former Secret Service agent and counterterrorism specialist. And my opinion, which I why I think this movie does sort of fall between these two stalls of co simultaneously be, being both really, really good and really bad, is because this is a great premise that they abandon almost immediately. Within 36 minutes, Cutter is hatching a plan to force the plane to land. By 43 minutes, the plane is on the ground. Right now, I kind of feel that that is like a bit of a mistake because it lets all the air out of the balloon. You know, if we, we talked about some of the other Die Hard on a Plane uh, kind of movies like Executive Decision or Air Force One, and they stay on the plane for the majority of the time. I think part of the problem with this film is they kind of back themselves into a corner because the plane is too small for any kind of the usual cat and mouse uh, hijinks that we come to expect. So they're like, oh, shit, we, we've got nowhere to go here except get... Uh, get on the ground. And once you're on the ground, because you're not in that kind of contained pressure cooker environment, um, the the tension and uh, stakes decrease massively. Um, so I think that was somewhat of a of a bit of a mistake because then basically we have a midsection where they they kind of fanny around at this carnival, um, aka Die Hard at a Carnival, Pepsi Land, um, before they eventually get back on the plane uh, for an admittedly exciting finale. So it's kind of like a structurally messed up newbie. We have a first act like setting up this great premise that gets immediately abandoned. They land, they dick around at the carnival, uh, then they get back on the plane for uh, for the ending. And it's only eighty, as you were saying, Liam. It's only eighty four minutes this movie but they still couldn't sustain the tension throughout the entire film 
Um, so I'm seeing a lot of head nods from have Ronald. Thoughts on... So Ronald, is, I get yeah. the sense you agree with this structural issue in the movie, or this? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's one of the main issues of the movie. Like you've you've made a film around the idea of one passenger on a plane, passenger 57. You would have been better off calling this movie John Cutter or Plane Security. Or something plane else, security. because the his plane his, security. Being, <laughs> yeah. his his big passenger fifty seven is completely unimportant to the rest of the movie. As soon as you put the plane on the ground, and the other parts, as soon as you put right. the plane on the ground, it's just this is just a, ter- a regular terrorist movie. I mean, when the terrorists got off the plane and went to the carnival, just for a brief aside, it it just felt completely. At this point, the the movie felt like it kind of lost its way, uh, and when we end up back on the plane, I'm. I, I realize that the only reason why that's happening movie wise, the only reason why that's happening movie wise is just so they could have this dramatic scene where Reigns is then thrown out of the plane. You know what I mean? So it's it, if that's the only reason we're back in the plane, then it didn't then maybe none of this needed to happen on a plane. I exactly. Have, yeah. I, it, it it's it makes it unfocused, you know, that midsection. As usual, I am a man <laughs> alone in my in my own in my own genius. But f- uh, before we, I, I well, there's a fine line between uh, genius <clears throat> and insanity, as Charles according Rain to Charles Rain, so that's you're true. Straddling yeah. that line. Well, before I he also said, when it rains, it pours. <laughs> before I offer my thoughts, uh, I think it's it's appropriate, Phil, for you to tell us about the ticking clock of the movie because it relates to this very thing. It does, and it's it's again. It kind of shines a light on um, some of some of the problem with it. So, so basically, Rain gets off the plane right around this sort of you know forty five minutes Rain into the movie, gets off halfway the plane. through. Charles Bars. Rain gets off the plane. <laughs> Bars, and he ends up being after a brief chase around Budweiser Kingdom. He ends up being um, captured. Um, but his cohorts are still uh, on the grounded plane with dozens of hostages. Now, he at this point in the movie, which is sort of end of Act 2-ish, he tells the police, my colleagues have orders to start killing passengers in 20 minutes if he's not released, right? Which leads to this negotiation with the police and the FBI. But it doesn't feel like a real deadline, and it isn't treated like as one there's a real lack of urgency to it you never even see a clock like we've got to get this figured out in 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 20 minutes he's going to start first of all 20 minutes feels like kind of a long time <laughs> to form yeah, it's, it's not like, like three in minutes five it's minutes, not a couple hours in yet. five minutes you're like fuck we've got to come up with some in kind of counter response 14 minutes like, some bad stuff's going to go like down in like two days right. you know like next week at some point we'll keep it casual they'll start killing you know it just feels very like the whole problem with that section of the movie which is it's it's random it's messy it's baggy and it's unfocused and the movie itself is kind of like that. It's like sketched out in vague okay. I've had enough strokes. of this. I've had enough of this. <laughs> um, look, there's a lot of movies coming out this time that take place on a boat, on a plane, on a whatever. What I actually appreciate about this is that imagine seeing this in 92 without the context. You're like, wait, the plane's going down? Wait, I remember watching it and thinking the best sequence in the movie is the sequence when he's in the when he's at the carnival. Like, I really like that part. And rewatching it now as an adult, to your point earlier, Ronald, it's like when these, like, sorry to say, redneck sheriff, like the guy who's doing the fog lo- foghorn leghorn is like, I'm negotiating the release of a hundred passengers. See, like, he comes on, <laughs> and suddenly it's like, this is the real, I mean, in a way, it's like, the villain of the movie are the redneck sheriff's department that like pull him over and that, that like, you know, mistake, mistake his identity. I just think that that's sort of the most like, look, with, with the pod, part of what we do is look for like what's interesting resonant, you know, the instant resonance of the story and the way the movie might be viewed differently or what it might be about. And I think it's interesting that a movie that stars the movie, a diehard action movie that stars the first black actor, there's this whole sequence where he has to deal with these kind of like, racist you know even coded or whatever like problematic cops i think that that's one of the most interesting parts of the movie so like while it's unfocused in a way it also does something that i think is really important which is it a little bit takes the focus off of and i know i'm jumping ahead here of charles rain the villain of this movie because well i'm curious what do you guys think think... of charles rain he's not insane uh... i just want to say he's not insane well, two things. I don't think I don't think taking the focus off of a villain like Charles Rain is is a good thing mm. because 
I, I mean, well, well, one, if you look at if if you if you look at the way he's interacting with the cops, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna loop forward then back to Charles Rain. Love if it. you look at the way that he's interacting with the cops, he is all of a sudden a just a regular black man on the streets dealing with the cops, uh, in a way that I don't think adds anything to the movie. It it doesn't, and I think if this was a movie that was actually doing that with intent then mm. it wouldn't solve it through violence. So later on, the way in which that he solves this racism problem is by beating the trash out of the cops, which is not a solution to racism. You know what I mean? It doesn't actually solve that issue. However, when he has to beat Charles Rain, uh, one, he is outsmarted by Charles Rain time and time again. You know, And later on, he does have to sneak onto the plane and actually outsmart Charles Rain by basically sneaking up on him and then enacting violence in order to throw him out of the plane. So in terms mm. of the face-off between him and Charles Rain, that felt more like a face-off of at least semi-equals than, than just like an action star black man and basically a super cop versus the actual cops. And at that point, because I think it, it, to me, if Key and Peele, Peele does this, I'm laughing my head off because they're pointing out the fact that he is the super cop and he can't even get past the simple interaction with the regular cops, you know? But huh. I don't, the movie doesn't feel like it does this with intention. It only does this as a way to slow him down when he's off the pay, off the uh, plane, so that Charles yeah, Rain can get plot, ahead. It's a plot complication, exactly. But I, I am fascinated by this this sort of semiotics and symbolism of him basic beating up those cops in a really awesome way, and then um, escaping on a police motorcycle and just basically saying, "Fuck this shit! I'm cutting <laughs> through <laughs> well, this." Like, I think that's very, very culturally interesting to unpack. Um, but I do suggest before we go on to Charles Rain. Uh, that maybe we should talk about our hero first. Well, right? I want to jump place on this that in, exactly. in wider context. Yeah, because he does a couple things in that sequence. One, the moment when he puts on the leather jacket on the plane is like iconic. Like it's kind of this thing where it's like, because then it's, he, in all of the advertising for the movie, he has the leather jacket on. He has it on on the poster. He And when he walks away at the end, he keeps the leather jacket on. And like that moment, the, the, I think the gives leather it jacket to, is the um, first thing. The flight attendant. He gives it to... Uh, because she's called her name, Alex Thatcher. But then the moment where he knocks those cops down and then hops, like jumps the fence, but doesn't like put his hand on it, but just literally Wesley Sipes springs above the fence and then like literally does a karate kick and knocks a dude on his ass is like the moment. It's amazing. Where you're like, we have a new action star and it is Wesley it's, I'm so glad. I, I just Snipes. I want to piggyback on that point because I wrote that down too, because no one jumps over a fence like Wesley Snipes. He is able to elevate mundane and generic action moments with these dynamic physical choices. That is like such a great example. There's also a moment in Boiling Point where he kicks oh, in a door Boiling where he plays Point. a treasury agent and he fucking like kicks this door as if it was like kicking someone's head off. He's kicking it so high because he was such an incredible... Uh, physical actor and martial artist, right? So even in the, even though this is kind of a, like it's kind of a mediocre movie, right? But in within that, he's able to transcend the material and make it something that kind of pops because he is so fucking awesome, right? Like as a, as an action, st on one he's an incredible actor, and we'll, I think this film actually kind of like um, he's he doesn't gi give him a chance to show his incredible range, even though he's awesome in it, because he's a brilliant comedic actor, he's a brilliant dramatic actor, he's obviously, this film focuses more on his, like, detached cool and his martial arts skills, and he's awesome at that, but he, he doesn't get a chance to show the full spectrum of his capabilities uh, as an actor, which we've seen in other other movies, and some very, very serious, credible movies, like the Spike Lee movies that you referenced, and... Uh, one Night Stand, you know, which was mm. a really acclaimed, you know, drama, you know, The Fan, which I love, Rising Sun, and movie. comedies like White Men Can't Jump. Wait, right? which one's a great movie? You can movie? do so many the things. The Fan. The Fan. Yeah, I just, re I just saw yeah. that for the I first time, the and I was like, holy crap. Ronald, were you like a guy that rushed out and saw Wesley Snipes movies when they came out? Uh, well, it, you got to remember when they first came out, I was in second grade. Right. So a lot of <laughs> so this you stuff, weren't. <laughs> yeah. So, it, but it, but around the time that he did, I'd say Murder at sixteen hundred. Actually, U.S. Marshals came out in 1998, and I definitely saw that because my parents were watching The Fugitive basically constantly. Uh, and so I, I saw that, and U.S. Marshals was obviously the sequel, so I saw that uh, 
afterwards and was really excited about Wesley Snipes. And he was just always kind of around it. Like just people were always talking about him wanting to be him. And he was just constantly in films, but like later on the, just to talk about his acting prowess, I really feel like he had started to started to dial it in, in the late nineties. Cause I feel like in the early nineties, he was doing independent movies, but that place from, and, and when I say independent movies, I'm talking about stuff like, like, uh, uh, Mo Better Blues, mm-hmm. New Jack City, uh, even, uh, Jungle Fever, you know what I mean? These weren't big budget films. So if you get to the late nineties, like, especially after 92, we're talking Pastor 57, Boiling Sun, Rising Sun, Demolition Man, Drop Zone, like they're paying him money, money train. They're paying him money for these, mm. you know? So when he starts to, and, and at that point, he's kind of playing the same character in all of those films. But you look at the beginning, go back to Jungle Fever, or you go back to Major League, or uh, or Major uh, League. New Jack I forgot City. he was in Major yeah, League. Yeah, those are different roles he's playing. So back good then, in that movie, as opposed to later. So I feel like his. That's range, what I'm saying. He has a lot of range. Yeah, yeah. but I don't feel well, like what he do you, tapped into it more until the late. 90s. But what do you think of this character, Ronald? Like John Cutter. Like, what do you think of like the marriage of? this movie star, this this character, and how do you feel about this as a particular character? I think that this is like, this is an archetype. And I think, and I had to, while I was watching this, I said, did, did Wesley Snipes originate, did Wesley Snipes originate this archetype? Because the archetype is very familiar. It is the, it is the, the guy who has been Mary sued, you know what I mean? For some reason he, be- oh, I'm sorry, who is the guy who has a Mary Sue, i.e. he has a motivating, uh, his motivation is that he has a woman in his life that was close to him killed in the past. And as a result, he is aloof. He has all of these skills. He doesn't know how to use them. He's lost, probably needs therapy, we'd say today. Uh, but is cool confidence and it's like i guess part of the trope that i don't like about that archetype is a lot of it is is still teaching especially black men to like withhold uh like information and rage because that's the cool thing to do and men you know drop kick people in that's how they solve their problems and there'll be another woman Mm. waiting on the other side of the door so but that archetype i'm wondering did he originate that because we see that in action movies over and over again we've seen will smith do that we've seen like you can go down through a list of 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 like of actors we've seen Steven Seagal do that. You know what I mean? Like you can, like there's so many people who play that role very well. And so it, it kind of made Nicolas Cage. We've seen him do it. Yeah. Uh, like it just makes me wonder, uh, even uh, Bruce Willis, we've seen him do it. Well, that's what I was going to bring up. Right? I think like, I can actually you, answer this question, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, of course um, you can. You, you, if you, you're the, yeah, you're the whiz. I, I mean, well, we're talking about archetypes, right? So this is the X blank archetype right yes. that was kind of yes. Thank recently you, yes. crystallized with under siege which are, was our last movie he in this where casey ryback his ship's cook but playing an ex uh, was an ex navy seal in this instance cutter is an ex secret service agent see also the last boy scout uh slightly different various because that's not that's a noir and not an action movie but i would actually say that this archetype and forget you know by all means challenge me because i was thinking about this i should have actually addressed this with under siege because we were saying well this is actually a new archetype the x thing It's not. It actually all goes back to First Blood, where you have a character Mm. that is seemingly unassuming on the surface, on face value, but turns out to have, to quote a later movie, a very special set of skills, right? Like uh, that, that, uh, that was really, I would suggest, in modern era of action movies. Um, the the first uh, example of this archetype of someone w- who is sort of hiding in plain sight with an incredible uh, skill set that ends up being utilized in this particular uh, scenario. So I actually think, and we will, th- but the other part of this to your, to your second point, Ronald, is that he's the man with the haunted past, which we will guilt see again in this, in this character. The haunted hero, right? We will see that in our next movie, Cliffhanger. Right, where we actually Ooh, see the trauma yes. writ large as part of the inciting incident of the film to some extent, or at least a, a sort of prologue backstory. So it's a combination, essentially, in terms of the archetypical archetype construct. It's a combination of these different uh, f- factors: haunted past, uh, a great word that you use, like aloof, kind of an you know, which I think Snipes does really, really well. Um, and uh, but an X something who has all of this uh, very particular set of skills. But Liam, d- dive dive in. No, yeah, I mean, I think to your point, the thing that I think the guilt and shame of this character is interesting. You know, there's the fla- the black and white flashback early on in the film, which I think is like pretty harrowing to watch, and has always been harrowing to watch, right? Where he he the 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 guy comes in and and you know tries to to rob the convenience store he's in, and he takes Philip 
Uh, excuse me. He takes Philip. Philip. He takes Wesley Snipes' uh, wife sort of hostage, and Cutter, Wesley Snipes' John Cutter, tries to you know intervene and 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 shoots shoots at the guy, which you know results in the murder of his wife. But it's a it's a really harrowing scene, and it almost doesn't juxtapose well against the scene that either precedes it or follows, where we have Charles Rain talking to his attorney. Like it feels like two different movies in that moment, and I think you know. As much as I've defended this movie, I think there's a there's a there's a tonal issue going on in this sequence of the movie. But it's- like I say, I just feel like everything is sketched in broad strokes, right? It's from the kind of movie, um, like almost cookie cutter to some extent. Oh, the the liquor store, the bungled liquor store robbery with his, but that just feels like such a trope for a character's backstory. And the general, there's a sort of the, the whole thing is like vagaries. Whereas I would say Under Siege is very very specific. Right. About like everybody's job, about what Casey Ryback's uh, exact background was, uh, about all the technical details uh, of life on the uh, the battleship, about William Stranix's background, about, you know, it, whereas here moving uh, to Charles Rain, he's also sketched in similarly like broad strokes. Right. He has no discernible ideology. There is a his sole backstory is his father was abusive. Right. So should we move on to our yes. villains? Can I say one thing? Or about, unless there's anything please, else you want to say about Cutter? Well, the yeah, only thing I say about uh, the haunted past is I think that there's a way that it's done well and there's a way that it's it's not done well. And, and I, I won't even say done well. There's a way that it's executed perfectly and there's a way that it's kind of just executed. And I think in this one, it's kind of just executed because when you when you said haunted past, the one thing I thought about was courage under fire. And you think about mm. Denzel Washington in that movie who mm. like, he, he has this whole thing that they're saying like, hey, this thing happened to Denzel Washington. It's coloring how he looks at everything. It's coloring even why he's working on this case. You know, and then later on when they show it we're like yo that's wild and not only that we begin to sympathize with what happens to him next as a result and how he makes up for whatever that issue is so i really just think the idea of the haunted past like the difference between this is just like my wife was killed uh and i feel responsible for it it feels almost so on the nose and then later on you know he's calls he then calls the flight attendant lisa you know as to say that it's still mm. on his mind so it kind of feels a little bit more hacky and a little bit like you know almost um almost in the ways that they parody this you know having a haunted past rather than it being something that like is a part of well, his it's DNA funny. to a point that it makes sense it's funny you say parody because suddenly a light bulb went off in my mind of National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon 1, yeah. which kind of cr- crosses over w- the next movie, which uh, uh, which crosses over both this and Die Hard, the Al Powell thing in Die Hard in the scene with Whoopi Goldberg in the convenience store and Samuel L. Jackson can't pull his gun. Yeah. Again, we, we you know oh, we, yeah. we crudely did a bit of pop psychology with like sort of Freudian analysis of, you know, when we, we talked about it a little bit on Under Siege, but there is something going on here, which is essentially like... He he in the in in the flashback he pulls his gun right do what you will with the symbolism of that mm-hmm. and it results in the death of his wife mm-hmm. so the next time we meet him he's 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 real actually the thing to do is to be submissive and passive which is what he's teaching uh, Marty Slate in the Alex Dacher character in the training sequence he's saying actually the thing to do is not pull a gun is not be the aggressor it's to mm. submit to the um, the aggressor's uh, desire and during the course of the film he he. Uh, changes his position on yes. that almost immediately uh, to but be like, no, the thing to do is, is pull the gun, which is the American way. Yeah, but that's... Sorry, go ahead, Ronald. The, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting excited, but that's, like, that is the problem for me because actually when you broke that down, I'm like, oh, no, that's absolutely correct. To do it side by side, said he's going to have some gun shyness, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't even have. There's he not abandons even a scene. It immediately. Yeah, there's not even a scene where he's like, "Should I pull my gun?" Mm. He's just like, "Blam, blam!" Time to I, time to start taking yeah, out people. You, you know what I mean? Time to fuck shit and, up. And, and but even the, the the flight attendant, she asks him. She says, "Didn't you just say we're supposed to do what they say?" And he's like, "Nah, we gotta save the planet." Yeah, it's a complete reversal. You know Can I, mean? I ask you guys about a scene in the movie that I actually think is one of the better scenes in the movie, which is before the hijacking. There's a moment where he gets up and he goes to like wherever the flight attendants hang out and do their work. Work. And there's this one, this really great, there's some really great oneers in this movie with good blocking where actually like 
they're the characters are interacting and and Kevin Hooks makes the choice not to cut. There's some good walk in talks in this movie, but this is the talk and talk. Yeah, the like, talks, yeah, yeah, but there's a moment in the film where he comes back and she's like, uh, the choreography is actually really good because she's doing her flight attendant duties, mixing drinks, getting things into the cart, and he is like, I'm actually looking for some Advil, and she reaches into her pocket and she hands it to mm-hmm. him, and then she's like, I'm busy, and he says like. I just need you to check on me. Yeah. It's 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 not that that scene doesn't fit. It's that and I'm really curious like as we discuss this what you guys think because to me like it feels out of character for him and maybe that's the point. I love that scene actually. Yeah. I mean that that interaction I think is it's it's good. I I like she's irritated with him. He's just trying to get some aspirin, and obviously he does have an issue with flying. Right. Um, it almost seems like it would make sense if the issue was attached to his haunted past in a way. Uh, and this, in the way that it does not feel attached, it does make that that scene in that moment feel out of place. Like you're yeah. building backstory, uh, even though we already have it for a character to know that he has issues on planes, but that doesn't come up again because we know that he's going to attach himself to the wheels of a plane and go up with no gear and climb in through the bottom. Mm. You know what I mean? So we know we can't have that much of issue with heights or with being on planes in, in, in that regard. So I think that for me, that's just that scene kind of points to the other ways in which this movie is kind of like shoddily built. Uh, it kind of like the scenes are just happening randomly. That is the best scene I'd, in the movie. I'd, I'd like think. to make one more point on that and then and then move on, which is it all comes back to Die Hard, right? Because McLean is afraid of flying, right? We meet him on a plane as he is Pissed arrived and he's toes. uncomfortable with, with air travel. The same thing was picked up with Jack Ryan in Hunt for Red October, who also does not like flying. This was like shorthand screenwriting mm. to suggest a macho character who has some kind of like slight vulnerability. But as Ronald's saying, I think it's all just a little, little haphazard with this movie. And there isn't like a, a, a clear line of causality between like the choices that he makes and his inner psychology and how those things are healed. It's basically like, I'm kind of haunted. I had nothing to do with flying. Uh, it was like a generic scene where there was a liquor store robbery. It went bad. I pulled my gun. Um, probably shouldn't pull your gun, but actually maybe you should. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know. Let's just get on with the movie. There's there's like 80 minutes to fill here. Let's go. It, it feels like that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, yeah. it doesn't yeah. feel in the way yeah. we talked with McTiernan that every choice was so thoughtful and considered. It makes for something that's entertaining and that doesn't make sense. And to that point, pivoting onto the, uh, the, the, the discussion of the villain, Rain's introduction doesn't make sense. Um, oh yeah, if, the plastic if we're, surgery. If we're right to move on to our villain section, how it, so great idea? I love this idea, like a fa- like a face off kind of deal. Like he's a terrorist who wants to have plastic. Su- so this is how we meet Charles Rain, just to set up. Wait, the real scene. quick, real he quick. Is you, in, sorry, um, real quick. I just have to comment on this. Do you think they were about to shoot and they were like, we don't have a name for the villain yet, and they like look and they were like, Bruce Payne, Bruce Payne. Charles Rain, and like it was like okay, cool, like let's go with Charles. It's just it wouldn't, so it wouldn't weird. surprise me. But so, but to be fair, the Reign of Terror is a pretty sick. Yeah, that was my like, nickname like, in college. I, I, will, I will give it. That. Um, it did work. So we Whoa. meet this dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, hold on, Phil. What was that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he makes this joke every episode. Oh, I love like, that. Even when it's not about Passenger about 57, <laughs> I'm still like, I'm the Reign of Terror, that. baby. <laughs> Phil, you're inoculated to it. You just blazed right on. You got the vaccine for my jokes. That's hilarious. So, so we meet Charles Rain in um, when he's about to have plastic surgery. Really interesting idea because he's like a uh, an international terrorist, presumed sort of on the run or or you know moving between the shadows and you know whatnot. But if you actually unpack the scene, it doesn't make sense because he says uh, to the surgeon, "Like, what time is it?" And the and there's a sense that the surgeons know. Like maybe there, there is a raid coming, right? At 12 o'clock, um, they're going to come in, in at 12 o'clock. From an inbound SWAT team. So he's asking, what time is it? As if he n- also knows that there's a raid coming. So what the fuck are you waiting for then? <laughs> like, it doesn't make yeah. sense. Why would you, why would Rain know? Oh, I'll so wait. So we'll have a sick here's, action here's sequence. Cool. But I'm going to push back a little bit. Exactly. Because Charles Rain is kind of like... purely for entertainment. Bit, it doesn't make any logical sense. Yeah, but there's a little bit of like the playful... Ins- like, look, I, this character is like underdeveloped in my opinion. I think Bruce Payne has some great moments like the when they're like, those two agents you killed were friends of mine. He's like, thank you for telling me. I love to know about whose lives I've touched. Like, really strong moments there or like when he shoots the kid with the handcuffs on but like 
there's a little Pretend little shoots, sadistic yeah. playfulness in his to go back to a movie we talked about before he reminds me of John Lithgow in Ricochet at times there are these like little bizarre choices that he makes that have Ricochet vibes but I kind of enjoy or does this. Remind you of John Lithgow in uh, in Cliffhanger Ooh. because yes. in a lot of ways that character. That's good because I, I feel like what they do a lot of the, this, especially in the '90s and the early '90s, late '80s, they wanted there was no nuance to evil. If you were evil, you were evil, and I think this guy yeah. is the problem. Is they are trying to add nuance to evil by saying he was abused, and I don't talk about my childhood. And I'm like, well, if you would have had therapy. Would would you be a terrorist right now? Like, is that where this is going? Because in some portions of it, the way he's interacting with his childhood versus like kind of being playful and all that, it it again, it feels random in a way that 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 still pushes towards evil, but still wants to give us a little bit of pause. Whereas if you watch again, if you go back to Die Hard and you go back to Hans, like the guy is actually you would be rooting for Hans if he had not shot a person in the face. If he had not shot, and he was so charismatic that if he had not shot a person in the face, we'd be like, "Hey, man, this guy's got." I still kind of root for him. That's and you, the thing that you makes still kind of root for him when, yeah. when they when they when they break into the vault. It's interesting your point, Ronald, because basically what we're we're discerning here is that if both of these characters had had therapy, there would be no reason to <laughs> die even hard have in a movie. therapist's office. Right. Would be sick. <laughs> die hard. There you go. Die hard with a therapist. Die yeah. hard with a therapist. <laughs> so, but here's 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 a here's the big question, right? Which I'm still struggling to decide. Is he good in this film? Is Bruce Payne good or not? He does not? the best with the material I kinda, that he I think so. Okay. I I agree with Liam. I think that I think that he showed up to act and 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 he was given a script and he said there's not much I could do here and he did the best with what was in front of him. Uh, because I mean, there's one point even in there where he's, where the, he's supposed to be lecturous, lecherous or whatever, because the, uh, uh, you see the flight attendant like walking away with some hot towels or something and he starts licking his fingers. And I remember yeah. being like, what is this extra gross. layer of, we get it. He's evil and gross. Like why, the why is this? Totally, thing with, with, I know? totally agree. I was watching that moment with my, with my wife and we both felt so romantic. Oh my goodness. Was, yeah. I show her this under siege, like, you know, all the. All the ro- all the romantic movies, um, but he all is the, the first. Vi- it's notable movies, because he he is yeah romantic like progressive movies like Under Siege, um, <laughs> which he refuses to watch. This is, this is the first villain though to cross that line because that is a really important moment that you just flagged, Ronald. Because it, it none of the other villains that we've ever done, and I can't think of any many subsequently either, actually crossed the line of being overtly sexually threatening. And it's it's like it doesn't need it. It's and if you actually unpack what he's threatening to do, he's basically saying, "I am going to rape you and then kill you in the process." Like that is like, th- whoa, we're like, whoa, guys, yeah. no, 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 you're you're way over the line there. Yeah, dial this it back. this is a light movie. Yeah, like it's a light action movie. You did not need to cross that line. It's a it's a real like I, I hate that bit. I have to say. Well, sorry, he didn't write that. It. That's a, and that's why we no, said it's when not we his say, fault. Yeah, he showed up and he played the part. But like you look at that portion, look at to the rest of the movie. You're just like I, you every time this guy showed up to act, and I I applaud him for that. But you can't outact a bad script. Just I've seen it. I've seen it happen with Denzel Washington. Who's the guy that was in the uh, in the movie with? Uh, it was Jared Leto, Denzel Washington, oh, and yeah. Robbie Malik. Oh, uh, the in little movie. things. Yeah, now on Hulu. Things. For those who yeah, want to you can't outact a bad script, and if that's not evidence, those three people are brilliant. Yeah, actors, they're good actors, and they could do nothing with that script. Well, and I you think I, mean? I actually so, really like that movie. <laughs> oh, God. I really like. I need to go I back. Love, like, it was a, in the it was in the procedural. deep of the deep of the pandemic, so I feel like my yeah. my metrics for it weren't great. I remember being like, okay, cool, and it was like new on HBO Max. Anyway, we digress. Payne is a Rada graduate and a Shakespearean actor. He does have a little a, a good bit in common with. Rick Alan Rickman. One thing I did wish they do they did with him. There's a moment in the movie where he's that what I call that confrontation where finally the villain and the hero come together and they get to like espouse on their philosophy. And he has this interesting line about like what does he say? That's the American way, brother. About like being taken advantage of or whatever. And I kind I like that moment because I think it like gives this guy a chance to do a little acting that isn't just like looking sinister and maniacal and. I wish 
that they had made him a little closer to Gruber and that ultimately it was about money. Because there's references to like, he's responsible for bombings in London and Ireland. And like, that's very mm. specific in 1992 to say he's responsible for bombings in Ireland and London without providing any kind of political context. And again, to your guys' point, it's like it's ramrodded vague. in there. Exactly. It's like, oh, if we say Northern and Ireland say and London, thing. everyone will oh, do the rest of the Oh, he's been untouchable work. because of his ties the to the Middle East. Well, we're in the Middle yeah. East. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a billion complicated com- I wish he was like a mercenary for hire that like took over, you know, kid that knew how to take planes down and stuff. Because apparently this is a world with, with where the they- Like Nick Cage in Face yeah. Off. With the face thing, I thought he was actually, I thought the twist, because I, I remember watching it, I'm like, is there a twist in this movie where he is Middle Eastern? Is that the twist? Like he changed his face oh, so wow. he looks like. That would have been incredible. Yeah. Uh, could you imagine? That would not have been palatable. But it's interesting. It's an been. interesting idea. What if he they turns his face into a li- young like Elizabeth Hurley? Whoa, that would be good. I lost you both. Everybody. I <laughs> I've just, never <laughs> seen <laughs> less of a, I went on a mental less vacation. Of a, less less of a reaction to one of my bad jokes. That was awful, you guys. That was the passenger 57 <laughs> of interactions on this call. We're going to some us. weird places. But you're right. There was some interesting uh, uh, stuff that I think you would find. I mean, you're you know, um, uh, a theater aficionado, Liam. I don't know if you are as well, Ronald. But there was some interesting background about, um, uh, about Bruce Payne that he'd once played uh, the title role in the Scottish play, wielding a baseball Ooh. bat instead of a sword. He'd had multiple uh, collaborations with Stephen Burkhoff, uh, including uh, a play he did with him at uh, the Donmar Warehouse, uh, was in Julian Temple's Absolute Beginners, and had a had an uncredited part in Michael Mann's The Keep, which made sense because it was shot in, in Wales. So it kind of had this interest and was part of this Brit pack that was a, a group of rising stars he um, never in, got the film uh, role in the though. 80s, but he never yeah. did anything well, he else. Was he... Yeah. So apart, apart from Highlander Endgame, where he played uh, a, a vil- the a villainous uh, immortal. Good um, actor, underutilized, I would say, unfortunately, is the is the breakdown on this guy. Let's talk about the other terrorists. Yeah, well, if we may, this is my favorite game, Ronald. Um, you're you're new to the show, so you, you can you know see what you think of this. But this is my favorite game. It's called Who's Your Favorite Terrorist? Who's Your Favorite Terrorist? Give me, give us. The... So I'm going to lay them out right. for you one by one. So I just need a little bit of latitude, a little bit of runway. Um, Ooh, our runway, first nice. Is, um, you yeah. like that? Our my first is the bad. Texas tornado. Um, if you, the mullet man who gets kicked into the toilet and is later executed by Charles Rain himself. That's James Short playing a character called Alan. He's the guy that's like, you know, when he's on the phone going, they're taking over the plane, they're taking over the plane. And then the, the mullet oh, right. man, who's, he's, really, he's really more hair than man. In fact, I think he's stolen Bonnie Bedelia's hair from um, the original, uh, <laughs> original Die Hard. Uh, there's him. We have... Um, the, the one who my wife calls him uh, the unmemorable Clark Kent. That's William Edward Roberts as Matthew. He's the bespectacled nerd reading the magazine while holding the hostages at gunpoint. Uh, looks like he's about to start an evil tech company. In the carnival scene, he climbs on the... Oh, he falls to his thing. death. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. We've got Mr. Forge, um, a.k.a. Mr. Forge Tubble. Uh, Michael Horse, the guy with the ponytail and earring. It's kind of got a Jimmy Reno from Roadhouse sure. vibe to him, which, I, which I'm which i into. Um, Renter Hench. Um, oh my God. That's Vincent, the scowling airline worker who, with the dark receding hairline, played by Mark McCauley, who also played um, Nasty Thugs in um, The Punisher and Bad Boys. Yes, Bad and Boys. Finally, Thank you. I didn't, I was trying to... He pops up in Bad Boys. Remember, he's putting on like the, the stocking over yeah. his face. Um, Sabrina Ritchie, played by... The incredible Elizabeth Hurley, who I think if, if this really happened, right, Elizabeth Hurley is so hot that <laughs> it, it, she she would get off, she would escape justice and then get her own reality show, which I would watch. That's my take. <laughs> There's no way she's going to jail. Yeah, so like, we're, no we're weighing in on our favorite terrorist. <laughs> Ronald, I want you to go first yeah. if, you, if, you, if you feel ready. Um, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to choose two because I don't believe in rules. Uh, so <gasps> Some men just want to watch the world burn. You're like John Cutter, you're an independent thinker. Uh, I'd say, I'll say uh, number two was obviously Sabrina Ritchie, uh, Elizabeth Hurley, because 
if I'm not mistaken, the only two people she kills were the FBI agents. So she didn't kill yes. any any um that's right actual passengers. So in terms of like like in terms of the indoctrination against you know police or killing innocent people, she didn't kill civilians, which was at least at least one redemptive. Quality. She's already making the case for her defense. Exactly. This is what I'm saying. Right. She's going to get off. Like, uh, and then the other one, but I say number one, obviously for me is uh, Vincent uh, Mark McCulley as Vincent because I mean he had some of the most important parts of the plan if you think about it you know like he's the one that that gets charles back on the plane uh when it looks like it's not going to happen uh, mm, he's while. the sniper he's also right? the one that he sends the he sends the weapons up to the main cabin from bottom and he fights wesley snipes first <laughs> well second of all of the henchmen uh downstairs although the one mistake he made was he gave up his uh he revealed himself too soon, too soon. like i think he probably could have been like playing around a little bit. I, I don't think know we should do exactly thing, what so. Mr. Rain yeah, says. And, and I yeah, remember, yeah. But he should have just, Too early. he should have just you, come up behind him and slit his throat. You had why an did advantage. You say that? Because like, it's a movie. Yeah. Advantage? Yes, I oh, know yeah. that. But, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. He was probably the most competent. Yeah. Movie be over yeah, in 17 minutes. It'd be, well, 20. Pretty <laughs> sick henchman, yeah. actually, our boy Vincent. Yeah. Like, high yeah. scores. I'm sorry, but the answer is Elizabeth Hurley. Because, because, when she turns, it's the it's like the hardest to take because she's so sweet with that little boy who might be the dick of the movie. Oh, yeah. And she's just like such a regular person. <laughs> and like she has this great interaction with um, Alex Datcher. So when she turns, it feels to me like, fuck, man. Like she's really good in this in this movie. Like talk about a, a, a part is. that, you know, there was also this thing that happened back then uh, back then in the 90s where like the main villain had like a homicidal girlfriend like the, I forget her name but the woman to, to Ronald's point Die Hard of the Vengeance the woman who like yeah that was the first one that occurred to me when you dudes. said that yeah yeah um, I love her yeah she's great <laughs> but I think she's really memorable in this movie and yeah I, it's also the start of like kind of an interesting career so I'm 100% Sabrina Ritchie our, Sabrina Ritchie Hive <laughs> yep can't disagree um, so should we move on Wait, to our next section? Yours? Um, the Sabrina. Oh, Ritchie, heck yeah. Our nice. sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. I like this. <laughs> Team Richie. Team Richie. All um, day, baby. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, so the action. Um, so as an, this is, I think arguably the other problem with this movie, which as I said, I do like this movie. I'm not here to bash it. Right. I'm genuinely not. I don't like to have but fun. The action in this movie this the action in this movie is not particularly memorable or good. There's very can you think of any like iconic images or or moments? What I think is really good in the movie in terms of the action is the close quarters martial arts, and in particular that sequence where Snipes escapes and beats up uh, the cops and just basically is like fuck, I'm done with this shit. I think that is the most memorable action sequence. I do think that I mean, so there's the opening set piece with the plastic surgery escape, not bad. Of course, the ubiquitous uh, water delivery truck. Have you ever seen one of those in real life? A water delivery like, truck? A water I have. delivery yeah, truck. I, never seen it I, mean, I, have. I thought they only I don't, existed I don't, I don't, I on the streets of action, action movies in in yeah. in, uh, in, in uh, unrecognizable middle American cities, which I think was somewhere in Florida. Right. But if you're in a Michael Bay movie, there's one on every yeah, street every corner, street. just waiting to be wheeled totally. out. Totally. Um, or in in Free Jack, a champagne truck for all the free jack heads um so we've got that we've got cutter beating up texas tornado then taking him hostage cutter beating vincent by the way the bit where he does what here's something i cannot fathom right this almost feels like was like a slapdash rewrite so when cutter beats up texas tornado right in uh and he throws him in like the chemical toilet right um and then he takes him hostage Okay, he, there's no real like quips there. Yet later, when Cutter beats up Vincent and kicks him through a door, he says like, "When you gotta go, you gotta go." But he doesn't kick him into a toilet. Why didn't anywhere. you say that the first time? <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Plus he didn't one, also. Yeah. Where did he go? He just went through the door. Like I thought he was kicking him through a door off the plane. He just kicked him through a door onto the floor. It doesn't make any sense. And then the finale is quite good, where I guess where he like the bit we talked about earlier when he can't, there's the chase to get on the landing gear, um, and then climb uh climb back on the plane and then that leads to this sort of uh a pretty exciting finale on board uh on board the the plane with the, the last kind of mano a mano scrap uh between uh cutter and pa uh, i keep saying pain but i mean rain um yeah. but the action like is this actually a good action movie it's kind of it's kind of not <laughs> it's kind of you know there's not the action ain't great 
if you're being really clear-eyed and critical. Ronald, it, what's your favorite action it, movie, Ronald? Ooh, that's that's a tough question. Okay, uh, sorry, yeah, I kind of threw be, that at you. You know, probably. I mean, it, it 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 phases. I guess right now, I'd say like the like the watermark for action movies right now is John Wick, obviously. <laughs> Um, like they, and that probably, I still think the only reason why the John Wick movies can exist is because of what the, uh, why did you ask me this question? But because of what, uh, the 007 movies started doing in terms of realistic hand to hand close quarters combat. So when you were talking about the close quarters combat in this movie, I remember thinking, oh, Ronald, don't compare it to the close quarters combat you've seen of today or something like, uh, that, what was that daredevil, the hallway scene? In yeah. The first, that that uh, one season. shot. Yeah, you don't really get stuff like that in the 90s, but the best thing you get is like those like one-on-one -on -one where, you know, one-on-one -on -one fights where it's like a knife fight and they're, the close shots are them showing the knife well, narrowly yeah. avoiding someone's legs or whatever. So, but I wasn't, there was nothing on this in this sequence that stood out to me as something that like was like, whoa, that's, you're really doing it in terms of action. And when you put it that way, I think it, I mean, I already wasn't a big fan of this movie that kind of grades it lower because you're right. I don't think the action was very good. So there's two things I just want to comment on. I don't disagree overall. I do think the music underneath the the, the handheld fighting scenes works really well and kind of sets it up, but is also incredibly cheesy. So like that is, again, a kind of a thing. One is when he jumps over the fence and he kicks the dude, that is like, again, the, that is the, sick. the introduction of a major action star who's going to be with us like for a very significant period of time. So I got to give points. Also, there is a moment when the plane is landing above the carnival and Kevin Hooks, it's the best shot in the movie. The plane is moving really fast and the camera is panning up. So it has this incredible inevitability. Like this plane is going to fucking crash. And it's like four or five seconds in the movie, but I rewound it. Cause I was like, Holy shit. This is like an incredibly propulsive shot in a movie that, yeah, otherwise kind of doesn't really like is a little rote and pedestrian when it comes to the action. A little tap. Yeah. But that yeah. moment, go back um, and rewatch it. Like I literally took a note on like, wow, this is well, a I think great the last shot. 10, 15 minutes are pretty exciting. Yeah. I really, I really do. But for the most part, again, if you're really like critically analyzing a movie and you can't name uh, like a set piece that is particularly memorable, it's only like um, these brief uh, martial arts skirmishes that are really like a second or two, which is realistic, right? Because I think in, in real life, mar you know, fighting t doesn't go on for minutes at an end. They tend to be like, it's kind of, pretty quick but it does kind of score the film lower as you, to use your uh, to use your expression so we're not going to talk too much about the humor because it mostly comes through dialogue so we'll save that for the best uh, line award um the leading lady we're not doing the whole tom jones routine i do do want to defend uh alex datcher briefly i think she i love her in this i think she's really elegant and and uh carries us i love her. i think she's kind of a queen and i think this she's like the second goddess on this flight alongside uh liz hurley on smoke show airlines but you know that's my that's my personal <laughs> that's my airlines. personal deal so i do want to i do want to kind of protect her and defend her a little bit um but let's move on to um the die hard oh, oscars oh ronald you're looking great with that tuxedo i like that tux nice. thank you very much yeah, very i don't slick. like wearing ties i hope you're okay with i'm that. fine with that i like the unbuttoned tuxedo look that's a really good one it's like you're going to the after party before for the party exactly all right so first of all as always we have the john mcclain yippee Kaye award for best line and our nominees are who's in charge i am bang once again who's in charge you are i like that one i uh, like the old uh, put yourself in my place mr cutter what would you do if you were me kill myself <laughs> That's Biggs to Cutter. That's I'm negotiating bit, the release of 100 good. passengers. Like, he's ridiculous. <laughs> 100 passengers. Um, here's one I, I really like, purely for Sabrina Ritchie, uh, Liz Hurley's um, dedication to correct grammar and correct pronunciation of uh, what is now the King's English. We were told to head back. By whom? By me. I really like the fact that she, she says who. She made, so it was not by who. By, by whom? <laughs> Even in a high tension situation, very proper, the grammar yeah. is on point. And then I had the roulette line, which interestingly you were not on board for, Ronald. I will not, and I and I I, I forbid either of you from voting for this line. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Fine. Fair. In that case, I'm going with my own choice, which is I'm negotiating for the race of hundred passengers. <laughs> That's my pick, Phil. I think what would you do if you were Kill me? Kill myself. That's Kill a great myself. line. That's a... it's, it's actually a genuinely witty <laughs> line. But yeah. But the but the roulette one is the one that the film is. I guess known it's for. iconic. Uh, it's kind of the catchphrase. 
Um, the Hans Gruber Exceptional Thief Award for Stealing the Film. And our nominees are Bruce Payne as Charles Rain, Alex Datcher as Marty Slayton, Robert Hooks as FBI agent Dwight mm. Henderson, Liz Hurley as Sabrina Ritchie, and Tom Sizemore as Sly Del Vecchio. I'd say uh, Sly Del Vecchio is, I mean, I, I really like Tom Sizemore, so I'll probably say Sly Del Vecchio. But a list person who's not on there is Biggs, the racist sheriff. I... Well, I had him in the next category, <laughs> yeah. uh, which which is um, the uh, the dick of the movie. But uh, I yeah. also vote for Sly Del Vecchio. We lost Tom Sizemore recently. He passed away, and I do want to give him like a bit of love because one of the one of the things I truly love about about movies, one of the things that's great about it, is that people that you lose in life, you get to spend time with them again in a weird yeah. way, and they kind of live on forever and spending time quote unquote with Tom Sizemore in this movie is such a delight especially because in this movie he my I asked my wife what she thought about him and she was a really interesting turn of phrase like I said what do you think of this character she knows how much I love Sizemore and she was like he's really endearing in this movie which is not a word you typically associate with him because he's usually a heavy right he's either a cop or a gangster or a soldier right and Tom Sizemore was my favorite actor of the 90s. When I was falling in love deeply with cinema, which was around the, 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 the rise of Tarantino. So, you know, in movies like True Romance and Natural Born Killers, and then, uh, you know, performances in like Strange Days and, you know, and then going on to like uh, Heat, arguably his most iconic role. And then he, he had a shot at Leading Man in The Relic and then Saving Private Ryan and, and uh, Black Hawk Down and, and many, many, many kind of great movies. But for me, and, and, and early parts in like Point Break where he's just fantastic. To me, Thomas Sizemore was electricity. He was like a lightning bolt that would go into, into a scene. And I love, I, like he, 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 I can't speak to his, like he has a complicated legacy, like off screen and, you know, he kind of lost his way, but as, as, uh, and then found, seemed to find it again later in life, which I'm really happy for and turned down some great performances in movies like Mark Felt. I loved him and I was really, really deeply affected by, by his death in a way that I don't usually get with the sole exception of Tony Scott. And I just wanted to like take a moment to. Uh, express a little gratitude for the the legacy of films that and, and performances that this incredible he lit up the 90s with the, his blazing talent and i just wanted to give a shout out to tom sizemore via con Dios, rest in peace and he'll be back on the pod for sure he because, certainly will he pops up yeah, many the times action is the in, juice. This, in this era I really always uh, I, always I, you called him endearing in this movie and i but i would argue that he was also endearing in heat like he was just endearing totally. in a different way. <laughs> yeah, he's like heart and soul of that movie in some ways. But and yeah, that movie, he's in a movie moves. called Heart yeah. and Soul, which like is one movie. of his most beautiful I like that movie performances in a truly beautiful movie. Um, so yeah, shout out. Now to, let's get vulgar again, Sizemore. Phil. What's the next award? All right, <laughs> all right. Our next award is the Dick Thornburg Award for Dick of the Movie, and our nominees are Bruce Greenwood as Stuart Ramsey, mm. the president of Atlantic International Airlines. Ernie Lively as Chief Biggs, channeling some Dwayne T. Robinson energy with a redneck twist. That's kind of how I'm seeing, like, uh, Biggs. Uh, Duchess Tomasello, quite quite the uh, screen credit, as Mrs. Edwards, the old woman on the plane who thinks Cutter is Arsenio Hall. Uh, Michael H. Moss as the smarmy FBI agent Manning, the one who's like... Uh, there goes my next ex-wife. And he has the worst haircut in history. Uh, and then Luther and Patrick, the two redneck cops who work for Biggs. If you have other nominees, please throw them in. But those are, those are my, my suggestions. Thoughts? Uh, in this order, uh, the plain guy who is already planning for, uh, who's already planning for a uh, John Cutter's death uh, okay, as a yeah. benefit to the, to the plane. Like, as we, as we, as as plebes down here should all be plotting to overthrow this playing guy. Uh, but number two would be Luther and uh, Luther and uh, Patrick. Yeah, Luther and Patrick, because I think Rig Biggs Riggs eventually came along. Yeah, but Luther and Patrick were just 
on the ground racism. I mean, before he gets kicked in the face, he calls him a boy. He calls uh, Wesley Snipes boy. And I'm like, nah, you got to get kicked now. You got to get kicked now. I don't believe in solving racism with violence, but you can expect it after you say that. My pick is Norman, the five-year-old boy. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, yeah, good pick. Though he's annoying. <laughs> yeah. He's the, I, preco- children, precocious children in movies can be really annoying. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with Bruce Greenwood because there's something the movie almost does, which is like, let's set cut her up as a patsy and it of course it never delivers on that but that's one moment in the movie where it's like oh cool they're gonna find it's jane dwayne tree robinson-esque as like you know like he's both the solution but he could also right. be our excuse and i like that in an action movie a scapegoat yep. you know uh, bruce greenwood is so good such a good yeah. actor that he's playing this part so um like grounded and, and realistic as like a ceo would think in this very like ruthless pragmatic way it's kind of like as if he thinks he's in flight, which he is then later in. You know what I mean? Like as if he's in a serious drama about the like a, um, a, a publicity crisis at an airline. You know, he's just he's such yeah. a good actor. Yeah. You know, uh, and he makes that character like it, it's very realistic because he's just kind of like a pragmatic dick who doesn't care about Cutter, but he's also like not necessarily doing the wrong thing in terms of what's best for his airline. But I, I think those are all excellent choices. Our final um, uh, award is. And I'm going to step back because this is Liam's moment. The best death presented by Marco. No more table. That's all I'm doing today. Let's go. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. it. That's you don't, you're you're doing the full. You're, you're not doing the whole. Ronald hog? just giving me looks, man. All right. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm so disappointed in you. Where life. are you going, pal? Next time you have a chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. Stop stealing my line. Right. I've got. I've got three. Well, you didn't do it. You know, you had your. You had your chance. Sabrina executing the feds. How do you like your steak? Bloody. Uh, Texas tornado being executed by rain. I thought that was kind of an inner... T- we haven't actually seen like the main villain killing one of his henchmen. It feels like that's tropey now. But in the movies that we've covered, I've never seen that. I thought that was kind of innovative. Yeah, where he's one. like, I loathe incompetence. And then uh, the rainfall, um, the finale, which is, of course, a very, very Gruber-esque, Gruber-esque death, death. For, our, for our villain. Thoughts? Cast your Ronald. ballots. I like uh, I like the henchman killing. I think in terms of in terms of saying I hate incompetence, I'm like, you know what, man? Hey, you got it. You had one job and you didn't do it well. <laughs> That's fair. Maybe if he cut his hair, he could kind of see a bit better Maybe. as to uh, what he was making his. Choices. I'm gonna go with the uh, the the indifferent terrorist falling off the carnival ride because it cuts him on the ground with like his <laughs> ass kind of in the air, and it's very disturbing. Yeah. Like I find that to be. Yeah, a, uh, I changed my vote. Genuinely my disturbing because he's right. like. Rah! And then, like, but they cut to him. Like, you never cut to the guy on the ground that close up. Like, I was like, whoa, like, yee, yeah. yee. we don't need that. He's so it's that dead, guy. Dead. It's the guy who falls and dies. All right. Good choice, this guy. All right. So we're going to move on to Double Jeopardy, uh, our trivia quiz. Um, now, for this quiz, do you guys want to compete or collaborate? Compete. Oh, shit. Oh, wow. Go on, Ronald, I was about let's to do be it. like, let's collaborate. You're a different man on a pod. <laughs> compete. Let's go. All right. Okay. Danny so, Rojas of this call. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Question number one. In one scene during this film, Wesley Snipes' character is seen reading a book on the plane. Snipes would later star in a 2000 action spy film with the exact same title as that book. Can you name it? What is the art of war? Jeopardy Correct. answers. Ding, 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 ding. answers. A film that co-starred Donald Sutherland, you... Michael Bean, and Die Hard on a Blank Favorite. I'll let you have that one. Thank you. Question number two. You're welcome. Which iconic action star was Tom Sizemore's character in this film named after? Sylvester Stallone. Very good. That's correct. Yep. Uh, his, uh, Sly. Who is Sly? Oh, come Stallone. on. Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it a tie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stallone was offered the lead role in this movie, but turned it down. Convoluted corner, 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 corner. Me, 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 me. Okay, question number. This is our final question, guys. Oh, this is this is. Hey, Ronald, a, you ready? Because I, I carefully. wanted to be friends. I wanted to be friends. Well, Listen, I've carefully. already won mathematically. So, all right. A piece of music from this film's soundtrack, entitled "Chaos on the Tarmac," was later used in the trailer for another Die Hard on a Blank movie released in 1995. The film in question 
featured the tagline, listen carefully, Terror Goes Into Overtime. Can you name that movie? I'd like to phone a friend. Okay, you're going to call Al Powell. This ice hockey-themed film starred Jean-Claude Van Damme. Sudden death. Sudden death. Ah! Sudden... Ooh, that's a photo finish. Let's call it a that tie. was a photo. Let's I don't want to. I don't want to adjudicate. We, we got this. We got this. Uh, we got this. Like internet delay. I literally was like sudden, and Ronald was like sudden. So you know, it's only a bit of fun. Just relax, guys. We're all friends here. So there's no prize. Let's get too tie competitive. Tie breaker? Um, I don't have one. All right. Well, in that um, case, so that's Passenger Fifty Seven, Ronald's favorite movie. Incorrect. I, I I like this movie. I had a good time. It's not perfect. You guys have actually made me like it a little less. So congratulations for, yes. for ruining oh, my did it, Phil. ruining my oh. not really ruining my childhood, but <laughs> but there's still much to en- enjoy in this movie. Snipes is terrific. Great supporting cast. Sizemore wonderful. Liz Hurley great. Bruce Payne a very entertaining performance. Yes, it isn't like uh, it's not one of the best Die Hard on a Blank films, but it was one of the earliest. It's culturally significant. Um, it launched Snipes as an action hero. It's a lot of fun. Um, at, the, at, at, at minimum, it's a fun movie to watch. And what more can you ask of any movie? Well, I know what I can yeah, ask. It Ronald. certainly wasn't one of the best Die Hard on a Blank films, but it was certainly a movie. <laughs> it was certainly a movie. <laughs> Con- great stuff. Speaking of a. Uh... I, I, lo- I had a really great transition and Ronald stepped on it. Ronald, what are you up to these days? What do you want the people who are listening, who've made it this far into your maligning of Passenger 57? What would you like them to listen to? Hear them here. What's going on? Well, first of all, thank y'all so much for having me. This was a great time. Come back anytime. Movies, and I love talking about them in this way. Uh, it's so deep. So I appreciate that. And I do love movies. You can listen to me talk about movies and television more on my podcast, Leaving the Theater, which is available everywhere you listen, where you mentioned before. I review films and uh, move, review films and television immediately after I watch them walking out of the theater or sitting on my couch after watching them. You can also check out and subscribe to my new podcast, which is coming out in August called Wait For It. Uh, it is a podcast about navigating the world in a plus size body, what that looks like, what that feels like. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. We just got accepted as an official Tribeca selection. So excited for people to hear the first episode. Thank you so much. And again, if you want to hear any more information about me, you can follow me on all of the socials at Oh It's Big Ron. That's at O H I T S B I G R O N. That's on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitter. TikTok. Thanks, Ronald. We want you come back anytime. We're here to talk. It's been great to yeah, have it was you. Great Thank to you. have you, Ronald. Hey, I'll come back us. anytime. I really enjoyed this. So I think we've reached the end of the show. Uh, if you haven't already, if you're still listening, c- congratulations. Despite the maligning of Passenger Fifty Seven, just the the terrible cruelty this movie is experiencing. Please rate the show, review the show, subscribe. Make sure you're subscribed. You're following the show. Most important thing you can do, if you have an action or movie-loving friend looking for a new movie podcast, because quite frankly, there aren't enough for them to listen to, please tell them about Die Hard on a Blank. You can find us on Twitter, for, for at least for now. I'm at Liam G. Billingham, and you can find us uh, on Twitter and Instagram, at Die Hard OAB. Phil, you, uh, you hanging out on Twitter these days? Having a good time on that, that platform? Yeah, mainly there for the toxic political discourse. Yeah, it seems good. Um, which I... Th- thoroughly enjoy and the uh, rising yeah, nationalism still... don't forget the rising oh nationalism. oh my gosh i am still there but i don't know for how much longer tell me about uh, it it's pretty it's pretty rough out there but yes you can find me at philip Cawthorn on twitter um yeah say hi and please shoot us an email you know we, we we're gonna do an email episode sometime soon we you and so please okay let me do it again and if you have questions things you'd like us to discuss on the fl- on the show and if you have questions things you want us to discuss on the show thoughts on a movie email us at diehardoab at gmail.com that's the best place to reach us you can also reach phil at helicopters in the sky at gmail.com i just made that up that's not a real email address but please email us your questions no i'm circling la like constantly yeah, it's actually so, amazing like, if how you good see you me say, <laughs> yeah just if you see me wave i'll i'll drop down um you know you can climb on those the, the undercarriage and it'll be it'll be great <laughs> it'll be really it'll be really cool <laughs> and safe uh, next time on the show Phil, what movie are we talking about? Cliffhanger. Oh, 1993, Rennie Harlan, Sylvester Stallone. Maybe? 
the best Sylvester Stallone movie. <gasps> Ooh, Ooh, controversial takes. To there'll be, be all kinds continued. of <laughs> there'll be all kinds of discussions, debates. We'll be talking about uh, John Lithgow's. Uh, uh, performance. Can you kill uh, a guy uh, with yeah, an ice pick? Actually, we know you can yeah. because it happens in Die Hard 2, so we know you can do that. Die Hard 2 director Rennie Harlan knows his way around um, a violent icicle death. Um, <laughs> violent icicle death, also a good band name. I'm Liam Billingham. <laughs> I'm Philip Gawthorne. And we'll be back next time with some new FBI guys, I guess. Die Hard on a Blank is a podcast created and hosted by Philip Gawthorne. Liam Billingham co-hosts and produces the show. Mike Mayer and Michael Sugar are the executive producers. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at DieHardOAB. Rate, review, follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Most importantly, tell your movie podcast-loving friends about Die Hard on a Blank. Special thanks to Suki Chu. See you next time on Die Hard on a Blank. <laughs>